Hey everybody, it's um, Shane here. I uh, just wanted to welcome you all along to uh, this session this morning. Um, we've got Julian presenting. It's the first time I've got to intro him during this iMOOC. So, what can I say about Julian? <laughs> no, all good things. We like him. We keep him on. Um, he does some good stuff and I'm pretty sure just about every one of you already know him and know his work. And so it's just a real pleasure to have him um, actually presenting rather than being behind the scenes. And so I'm sure you'll enjoy this. Uh, it's crickets. <laughs> All right. Um, without further ado, here's Julian. I'll hand over to him. You know, that's what I love about iMovie. Mean, these very formal, professional welcomes that we do. <laughs> Not that I can talk, just for the record. Um, there's a. I often put into our chat session down here the initials PKB, Hot Kettle Black. Um, Morning, evening, hello everybody. Thank you for joining us for this session. Um, I actually am seeing a couple of familiar faces. Who is actually here for this session for the second time? I think, I, I, I think I'm seeing a couple of faces who are here for repeat punishment. Um, also, if you wouldn't mind, what I'd like to do, just so I get a feeling for everybody is, if you could quickly just put down where you are in the world right now and the time, That'll also give me a bit of a feel for uh, just how awake you're going to be and, and how, how exciting and loud I need to be to keep you going. Yeah. Oh, Canada. Oh, I love Canada. I, I try and go to Whistler when I can. Big, big fan of skiing up there in Canada. There are more Australians on the Canadian ski fields than Canadians. You're quite at home, actually. <laughs> Del Harbour, Wellington. Well, great. Well, thank you, everybody, for, for coming along. Um, this session, as the, the slide and, and, and the poor dissected <laughs> image of Frogger suggests, is a dissection of a game-based mineral course. Um, what really surprised me this year, as we were, you know, did our call for presentations and had lots come in, is the, the strong lean towards gamification uh, as a discussion topic, and uh, which also is, is a passion of mine. And, and of course, uh, the launch of Badges in 2.5, and we'll talk about actually a little bit in this session, because we've we'll, we'll seen how much all of you are enjoying this, you know, playing with Badges and seeing the impact that that kind of reward has uh, as an educator and as a student. But so when all these presentations were coming through, lots of people were talking about theories, talking about uh, you know, anecdotal evidence. Really what I thought I'd try and do is give a presentation of a course that I've built and then reverse engineer it, show you how it was built, explain why it was built. Because while I am a fan of gamification, um, of reward mechanisms, um, what I'm not a fan of is, is reward for reward's sake. Uh, I do believe that that has uh, you know, short-term impact, but not long-term uh, long use. And, and even IMIT. Now, IMIT itself should be pointed out, this is not an education site, it's a conference site. But even here, you're probably feeling a bit that you, you know, the, the excitement of badges that first day and a half is probably starting to wear off now. You know, that excitement you felt getting your first badge is now, oh look, there's another one. Um, and I want to make sure we, we kind of talk about this, I think, because uh, like all things, like, like all new, new, new paradigm shifts or, or methodologies that we practice with, it, it's about you know, how we do it and how we balance it. And Maureen is already in the chat doing what I want people to do. Um, this I really want to encourage to be a discussion session. Now, it's very good that I actually don't really need to highlight that, but I've loved that I knew. Um, I, I nearly said this year, but it's actually been great most years is the active back channel. You know, I want people to discuss, to debate, um, to, to give their points of view. I, I think it's great that we do that and, and share our knowledge. So without further ado, let's move on to slide, oh, I'm not a presenter, here we go, uh, to slide two. This is actually part of a series I like to give when I train called Bling Your Moodle. Um, some people use the word pimp your Moodle. I always get in trouble when I use the word pimp around certain, uh, certain institutions. So I've gone with more of a, a, a bling reference. Um, the idea of these kinds of sessions is really about trying to encourage educators to move beyond the idea of what we call pump and dump or, or you know, dump and run 
uh, education styles. You know, many of you I'm sure are familiar with courses. In fact, I always like asking who here has a friend, uh, I'll put that loosely, who has a course that really is PDF, PDF quiz, PDF Word document quiz. You know, who here has a friend who has a course like that? It's a rich question, you know, I think, because you know, most of you will start saying yes. And by the way, I don't want to say that that's evil and bad and those people should be uh, you know, drawn and quartered. It's where we start. But where I do get frustrated is where educators who have now been doing this for a year haven't moved on beyond that. And so, so this is part of a series called Bling and Moodle which tries to encourage uh, people to go a step further. So if you're one of those people, and Nicole, thank you for being brave and saying me. Um, again, please, I'm not going to say that you're evil or, or devil incarnate, but uh, hopefully give you some ideas. And I think I, I think I'm going to give you lots of ideas on how we can change that. Okie dokie. So um, I hate marketing slides. I work for these guys. The end. Uh, if you wanted to find out more, check it out the website or obviously go and watch the replay of our sponsor session. Uh, you're not here to hear a sales pitch, you're here to hear about gamification. So obviously we, we talk about online education. In fact, let's forget online education. We talk about education in general. We talk about the importance of engagement. An engaged student is easier to teach. You know, we, we used to talk about those who came to my uh, session on there's no such thing as e-learning. Uh, hear me half on this a fair bit. Uh, Education works best when we can engage a student, and I might talk about all the bells and whistles necessarily, but a disengaged student is far harder to, to fill up with knowledge. So having said that, our online spaces also need to be engaging. And I want to talk about you know, how are ways that we can do that. How can we move beyond the idea of a bag it and tag it repository to sort of content and move something a bit more? Now again, next question, I'm into audience participation. Just so I know, who here does blended learning or are 100% online? Actually, Maureen, this is where the fracking presentation came from. Maureen's referring to the fact that I did a presentation a while ago where I admitted to stealing slides from lots of my other presentations. Yes, this is one of the presentations that was stolen from Maureen, so well picked. Okay, we're seeing lots of blended. Uh, Stuart's online. The reason why I ask this is because I, I often feel that you know, I'm a, we do deal with a lot of educators who come from blended backgrounds. Especially blended gets underutilised because with pure online learning, yes, we have to think about engagement at a far, far higher level because this is where we see our student. But it's where the blended doesn't take the most advantage of it because people who have blended learning go, oh well, no, I don't need to worry about my online courseware because I'm going to be directing them. And, and I think you do yourself a disservice when you do that. So, look, so how can we move beyond that? How can we do something a, a, a bit different? And I've already mentioned this word engagement, and I'm very keen right now to stress something. When I'm talking about engagement, I'm not referring to bells and whistles. And uh, again, those who heard my talk about e-learning um, heard me harp on about this. It's something that's a very big deal for me. When we talk about engagement, bells and whistles are a, are a tool, but they're not the key. Now, what do I mean by that statement? Engagement for me is not a flash video, is not an interactive game. Engagement, what I'm talking about, is, is a pedagogical uh, or academic style of engagement. I want them to engage with the content. Uh, if the student engages with the content, I, they'll want to interact with it. They'll, want to, they'll be reacting to it. They'll want to repeat it. They're going to want to inquire and, and, and discover. They're going to respond. They're hopefully going to create. All of these here are, are keywords that I put towards pedagogical engagement. If I can engage a student with my, with my resources, if I can engage a student with my curriculum, then yes, through that engagement, they will learn. Um, now, and this is where I said, by the way, this is where things like games and badges and, and all these different things, they are tools. But the problem is, many people think of engagement as that short term, oh look, they're watching the screen. Oh look, they're watching me in the classroom. Um, I really want to try and take the focus away from that. Um, I, I see so many gamification courses actually fail because they get so caught up on this immediate gratification of reward, um, look at me, look at me, that they actually lose focus on what their, their core purpose was in the first place. And the reason we're going to reverse engineer a course, and I'll explain how we're going to do that in, in just a second, is you'll actually see that, yes, I've got this course around this idea of some game-based concepts, 
But more importantly, they were actually all there driving specific uh, educational objectives that I had. It wasn't a reward for reward's sake. And that's what we're going to be highlighting today. So, where do we start? The first thing I like to do, and again, I apologise for those of you who came to my e-learning talk, because you're seeing the beginning. I promise we're going to diversify, but you weren't posting these slides already because I stole quite heavily from this presentation. Um, this here is a very important slide for me. In fact, this slide I illustrate with iMove. The first thing that I always do uh, with courseware, be it gamification or otherwise, is I try and get the perpetual motion of socialisation engine started. Now, that is a rather long term, perpetual motion engine of socialisation. But what do I mean by that statement? Well, if I can get students, and let's forget online link for a second, if I can get students to connect with each other, to, to start discussing, to, to start um, sharing ideas, well, through connecting, they start to collaborate. Once they start collaborating and working together, be it formally or informally, they start contributing through that collaboration. And the more they contribute, the more they connect. Yes, what you're seeing here is connectivism. This is how I like to as easily visualise a convectivist, a convectivist, sorry, it's been a long day, and what's even worse is I've actually just had my sleep, so I've only just gotten up, a convectivist standpoint. And the reason I highlight this is one of my many purposes of games is to actually start this engine. Now, the reason I call it the perpetual motion engine is that once it's started, it's very hard to stop. And let's talk about the games in iMoot for a second. How many of you logged in on day one and suddenly discovered you had a badge. So how many of you logged in and just suddenly looked at your profile and you got an email and went, oh, I've got a badge? I think most of you should have. I, I read it so that I think 99% of people would have got their first badge. Fantastic. What was the, your immediate reaction to this badge? I want you to be honest, because there will be different, different views here. What was the immediate reaction to receiving an unexpected badge? Okay, what is this? Ah, how do I get more? I want to, ah, okay, so first of all, did you actually know what it was? Like, I, I know we've called it a badge. I know that now we've talked about badges and, and some of you may have come to my badge presentation. But when you got this email, you notice that we didn't really tell you much about it. it there was a sense of, of mystery. It, it, you know, and, and I like this, people wanted another one. Um, Nicole and Garrett, what did this mean? It was actually quite intentional on my part. I didn't want to give you information. So what happened next? And I know that, again, people will have different reactions, but I actually saw many of you doing it. So you got a badge. Many you said you wanted more. What did you do next? And what did you do next after you got that first badge? Okay, so slide went to middle.org. Gareth has gone to another external website. I know many of you did it because I actually was seeing it. How many of you started going to the forums and finding out what was going on? I mean, not all of you, but I recognise quite a few of these names. Because you got this, and the first thing that, uh, that you did, okay, and some people said they didn't do it till later. Again, by the way, I want to highlight this, because it's quite cool how you see these things evolve, how different people handle it differently. Some of you went straight into an exploration mechanism, in, in exploration mode. You went off and you went, said, I like that, you went to middle.org, you, you went to this backpack, you, you started, dare I say it, learning, but you're self-driven, you're a, a self-directed learner, not student-centred, dare I use that word. Others went to the forums. And again, we did not set up a forum called Badges. People in the community started discussion. In fact, what happened in the first 24 hours of Badges, we had over 40 posts in our forums of people talking about Badges. And what they were doing, first of all, was connecting. As they started to connect, they started to talk. They already started to form a very informal, loose relationship. And then they started talking about where they found them. And as people use the forum, what happened when you started using the forum? Can anybody tell me what happened once you started using our forums here? What happened? <laughs> if you started using the forums, all of a sudden, 
it generated another patch. It was called the communications badge. We take it into our discussions of, I just got this badge called the communications badge. How did I get it? What have you got? And then people start collaborating. Now, I illustrate this. We're going to do this a lot more if you go through the presentation. But this is what I want to highlight when we talk about gamification as a mechanism of engagement. By, by creating these elements, I created a mean that you wanted to connect. You started to collaborate. People just started talking about how they got the badges and where they were going. They were contributing. As they were contributing, more people went to the forums because they were hearing about it and more connected. And because of that, or not, not solely because of that, but we've now seen a community this year that's actually been far more communicative than in the past. And badges aren't the sole reason for that. We've got a great group, great bunch of attendees this year. But I do put a whole bunch of that down to the badges because you've had a united focus of wanting to move forward. So yes, um, let, let's move on. So I don't want to harp on too much about badges right now, but this, what you're seeing here, is a major part for me of why I want to make engagement such a big deal and ways that I do it. Now, um, let's now talk about uh, the, the, up the top, that logo there, there's no breach of copyright at all. That, that, that's a Moodle logo, you'll notice. Um, I often do it called the Moodle Masterclass, and we actually, I often in the Masterclass do a session called Cooking with Game. And so I'm actually using elements of the Cooking with Game as we go through our dissection elements. So let's go through and start. Cooking with Game. Many of you already know, you know, Moodle is, is uh, purports itself you know, to support different learning styles. And I always disagree with that statement because Moodle doesn't support learning styles. You do, what you put into your site. Um, if you choose to go down gamification or problem-based learning or pump and dump, if you choose text-driven issues or you want to text-driven you know, text resources or media, that's up to you. But what I always get excited about with Moodle is that it supports teaching styles. What I'm about to take you into as we, as we reverse it to the other course, you know, once I finish my little intro here, is um, my teaching style is, I, I like to say, probably rather unique. And I know I'm not alone, but obviously I'm a communicator. I do like to collaborate. Uh, of course, in the intro, I've got to mention that, yes, I have been a teacher. Uh, I used to work for a, uh, a couple of secondary schools here. In fact, I discovered Moodle uh, about eight, nine years ago when I, I actually ran my own little moot when I was at a school for Monty San Angelo here in Sydney, Australia. And um, actually that's when I first met Shane with the canoe again. And as you can see, it's been downhill to me since then. Um, but what I discovered with the first Moodle tool is that every teacher could use it differently. And in my case, um, I taught uh, modern and ancient history uh, with, with, with senior students. Um, and uh, I don't know if anybody here teaches history. Yes, Stuart. Um, it was a very, very hot moot, that one. I think we hit about 38, 39 degrees Celsius, and there was no air conditioning in our main auditorium. Thankfully, I also had um, masseuses during the round. The only thing that stopped us having a riot from memory. But moving forward, let's not digress. Um, so I said, you know, I used to teach modern history. Now, if anybody here actually has taught or, or, or hangs around with history teachers, history is a fantastic subject to teach. But what we try and do with history is introduce as many artefacts, as, as many different points of view as possible from multiple media, be it uh, poetry or journals or battle maps or official record or, or, or whatever else it might be. And we try and teach students how to analyse multiple points of view, multiple resource types, all these different artefacts, and then try and form a correct point of view. And Moodle's great for that because it's a tool that allows me to point links towards different websites. So I remember during Gulf War uh, One, uh, I would actually point to Al Jazeera and the BBC News websites and get students to try and interpret and learn about things through that. So my teaching style, first of all, I'm very much about student-centered practice. I, I do like students driving themselves forward. Um, you know, student-centered practice isn't just about things like portfolio, but for me it's about, I'll give a loose task that the students themselves will self-direct their way through. I'll give them a whole bunch of resources to let them find their own uh, conclusion. You know, I'll, I'll guide, but hopefully get into that right direction. And I'm a big fan of communication. Many of you who have heard me speak at least once before know that I don't stop uh, in a classroom that doesn't change much. And just like I'm doing here, I like to ask lots of questions to get you thinking about the purpose. So the reason I want to stress all of that is what we're going to be talking about here as we go through dissection is my teaching style. And uh, you will agree and disagree with it. it will, some parts will match yours, many parts will not match yours. 
Um, but I just want to highlight that this is one of the beauties of Moodle, is that you can really adapt it very strongly to make whatever teaching methodology that you go with. But before we move forward, now this is a quote. Now actually, I well, on the, when I framed the presentation to this rail, and I can remember who did it, this actually was a quote from last year's iMood. A gentleman by the name of Justin Hunter uh, came along and did a fantastic presentation. But he used this quote, and it stuck with me. Just because we build to standards does not mean it has to be built to standard way. One of the biggest excuses I find when I work with corporates, when I work with universities for their pump and dump courseware, for this dull, unimaginative view, is they say, oh, it has to be this way because it's built to standards. That's not an excuse, everybody. Make sure you feel free to steal this. This quote isn't from me, uh, but a gentleman called Justin Hunter from the US. But it's a fantastic quote and one that I now live by. It's become my credo. Now, Moodle 2 became a game changer. Now again, I know many people in the room here actually have been around for quite some time since the old Moodle 1.9 days. You know, all, all of a sudden, I, I feel like you know, the uh, Yorkshire men from uh, Monty Python. Well, I remember when I was young, I used to live in a shoebox in the middle of the road. Now I remember when I was young, I had Moodle 1.4. You wouldn't believe it these days. Um, yeah, the old version of Moodle is so different to how, how far we were. And the biggest game changer for me of all the new features that came in too, the biggest game changer for me was all of a sudden it went from being a scaffolding tool to being a lesson planning or, or, or a learning scaffolding tool. And what I mean by that is Moodle One, the Moodle One series was a dumb system. Now what I mean by a dumb system is it lacked intelligence. Moodle Two allowed us to give Moodle a brain. We introduced a new feature called completion, as I called um, completion tracking, which allowed us to actually now tell Moodle what complete meant. This forum is complete once you've made three posts. This uh, resource is complete once you've read it. This uh, assignment is complete once you've submitted or received a grade. Many of you have played with it by now. Um, <laughs> I knew I shouldn't have started down the Python path. Um, that's right, we can, I will sit down and we'll bring out a comfy chair. But let's not go off tangent again. Um, so conditionals, uh, so, so completion tracking added this huge new ability to give Moodle a, a, a brain. We then added a feature called restrict access. Now that's what it's called in the settings. I don't like the word restrict access. What you'll find many people in the Moodle community refer to it to is conditional activities. Because what we think about when we think about the word conditional is that I can use this completion to now set a requirement. You can't do this until you've done that. And the reason I highlight this is that many people have discovered this and they're using it, but they're using it in what I call a linear flow, which doesn't do it justice because a linear flow means do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. And while in certain areas that's appropriate, you know, I, I, I used to harp on about how much I hated it until I came across uh, a technical trainer who worked with electricians who said, yes, but I don't want my students experimenting with three-phase power supply. We have to do things in order so we don't kill people. So yes, there is a role to linear flow, but it, often it's overused. What I love is adaptive flow. Now what we call by adaptive flow is exactly how I teach face to face. Face to face, I have a lesson plan, and then in that lesson plan I've got various learning pathways. And it's common sense if you're a face to face teacher. I have a set of core tasks, and if a student is slow or suffering, I've got an additional task to support them. And if they really get it, and you know they're in fact they're getting bored, I have an additional resource to to expand it. And so the reason I mention this is this for me was a game changer. Because in middle 1.9, yes I could scaffold all these things into one place, but nothing really stopped the students doing it whenever order they wanted. In Moodle 2, I finally had a lesson plan, a scaffold, uh, a, 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 a set of learning pathways and branches that allowed me to do it. And because of that, we can now do game-based learning. The course we're going to be looking at it was built before Moodle 2.5. It's using all standard features of the Moodle 2.x series. If you're using 2.0 or 2.1 or 2.5, you'll be able to build the course that I've got. So, near the end of these slides, but I actually want to get into this course. What is game-based learning? Look, the fact that it's so late in the in iMood, most people will have heard this by now. But for those one or two that haven't, I'm very keen to identify really what game-based learning is about. Game-based learning is not about, oh, I've taken this game of Frogger 
uh, but each of the things on the road are now actually uh, soldiers uh, from King Edward. And the little frogger is replaced with a little brave heart, and, and he has to now cross the English countryside so he can sack cities of York and not be hit by it. Many people think about gamification. They think about trying to create physical games. That is not what gamification is about. And I'm just very keen to highlight that. Gamification also is not a new thing. So you see me looking down here, I just want to actually find a quote that I, that I absolutely adore here. Um, what gamification is, it's actually a combination of two different things. It's first of all, it's problem-based learning. Now we've been doing problem-based learning for generations, especially if you talk about uh, certain subjects like math, uh, mathematics. Problem-based learning is rather than read-write repetition, it's we learn through solving uh, a puzzle, solving a problem. And in fact, if, if we look at um, in Australia, and I think in the UK, there was a very popular mathematics system for children called the Kumon system. I was one of the poor children who was put through the Kumon system. The Kumon system was not about understanding numbers, it was about memorising numbers. And so we would sat, sit there and every afternoon for an hour do timetable drills and do tests on timetable drills and have to do them faster and faster so that we would memorise the times table. And that actually hurt me later on in life. They actually didn't know how the numbers actually fitted together. Um, personally, I love Asian education with mathematics because they still give children an abacus. And the great thing about an abacus is that you get to visualise you get to visualise how these numbers fit together, and that helps them solve problems. And that becomes bigger as we move forward. So again, problem-based learning, nothing new. You're probably all familiar with it. Next, we also have narrative-based learning, also been around for generations. When I talk about narrative-based learning, it isn't also saying I'm telling a fictional story. I'm telling a narrative right now because I've started with one element and A leads to B leads to C leads to D leads to E. It is a story. And the reason as a teacher or as a trainer we like to tell a story is if there's a level of coherence between points, students will far better remember how they fit it together. And sometimes I'll think about one point and actually lead them to the next because they remember the narrative that we told. That being said, narrative-based storytelling can also be fictional. Um, Justin Hunter, I mentioned from last year, did a fantastic course. And what he was talking about was this idea of zombie-based learning, uh, a coy hip phrase. And what he was doing with zombie-based learning was taking students who are struggling with geography. Geography is not an exciting subject. I don't know if anybody here who teaches it, but it is not exciting. It's, it's mapping, it's data, it's what we call GIS, information systems. So what he did to engage these struggling students was he combined narrative and problem. What he did with the narrative was he changed the story. The world is ending. We're being invaded by zombies. Um, the first thing we're going to have to do to make sure we're safe is plot on the map where these zombies outbreaks are happening and how fast they're spreading. So we started teaching basic mapping skills. And now the zombies have hit our town, so we actually need to find a way to escape. So we have to look at topographical maps so we can figure out what's the fastest and safest way of quickly getting out of the town. When you combine narrative and then add elements of problem solving, that is what game-based learning is. A combination of two existing paradigms. And that's what I want to highlight before we move forward. It, and by the way, inside that we can use engagement tools such as a nice flash game or an episode of Frogger. But the thing is, that itself isn't the game. The game is the narrative that we're telling, full of problems that they have to solve to move a story forward. And once they solve a problem, we reward them. And so the quote I was going to read, this actually came from the presentations I saw uh, yesterday. Gamification um, is the use of elements such as points, challenges, feedback, reward, and badges um, to increase engagement and modify students' behaviour. So in other words, traditional online learning, we use a stick. Do this or you fail. Do this or you're not competent. Do this or you will not pass. The idea of game-based learning is do this and get a bag. Do this and unlock a new piece of a new piece of content. Do this and get a reward. And through that, we can drive them down our narrative path. And I explain all of that because that's very strongly what the game-based course is that we're going to be walking through. So that's it for slides. 
Now, what we want to do here, and this is why I want you to be very careful, because please do not close this window. What I want you to do is open up a new tab, or if you still have the other one open, I actually want you to go back to the session space. Because in the session space, I put a link to the game-based learning course. So I'm going to give you a second. In fact, I'll actually put the direct link into the chat, into the window here for those who uh, don't want to have to go back. That will probably make things easier. What I want to do first of all is bring you into a course that I built. And so I said, leave the audio going here. You don't need to be able to see me. I'm not going to be doing anything on this screen. If you cannot access this course, let me know. Because what I want to do is first of all is put you through this course as a excuse me, as a student. And once we've done that, we're going to dissect it, talk about how it worked, how it was built. Once you're in that course, if you could quickly just type in a yes or an I mean into the chat, just so I know. Again, I want to stress that this course was built in Moodle 2.1. So yes, I have added badges because I also want to talk about badges. You know, they're new and exciting. But I just want to highlight that this year is a 2.1 course. Uh, I will be putting this course up as a Moodle Restore that you can download. Um, I'll be doing that right after this session. I've actually meant to have done it earlier, but I forgot. Um, so you'll be able to download this and restore it into your own Moodle sites later on if you want to play with it as well. Okay, so welcome to the game-based learning course. Now, as I mentioned, I used to teach history. This is just a couple of sample units on Australia and the Vietnam War. Now, you first you'll see my design. I'm actually quite keen to highlight this. I love using blocks, not just for the Moodle yeah, uh, navigation elements. It's a fantastic place to also put content. The same way that a book doesn't just have straight pages. They often put things in margins and in columns. Uh, I must have been quite visual and like to do that. So what you're seeing on the side there uh, are things such as you know, HTML blocks with, with quotes in them or pictures. So let's actually start off in the middle here. Achievements unlocked. The first thing I'm doing here is I am telling a fictional narrative. I'm putting my students into the role of a soldier. Um, as you work through this course, you can unlock achievements, but we won't make it easy on you, soldier. You'll need to work with your squad in order to unlock them all. Also keep an eye out for slouch hat. This will reveal secrets when clicked. You can also use the officer's nest to share your discoveries and coordinate your battle plan with your squad throughout the course slash mission. What I have done here is given my first basic objective. I have identified that there is a game. In fact, there are many, but I've identified that there is a first game. I have encouraged them to collaborate and pointed them to a place where they could do it. And the very first game are slouch hats. Now, I'll tell you what the first one is, now that it is exploring in a second. Up the top right of the screen, you should all see a little picture of a slouch hat. It's a little tiny. A slouch hat, for those of you who aren't familiar, is the hat that the Australian soldiers used to wear back in, in World War One. In fact, it's still part of our dress uniform. But it's very, it's very distinctly Australian. And uh, it's a little figure I, I want to use. If you click on that slouch hat up in that top corner, you'll find it will load an additional resource. Now, I should also point out I'm a musician. And so uh, I like using, especially history, is a fantastic <laughs> place of doing some musical history as well. In this case, I put the you know, war, what is it good for? But not just as a random, here's a cool tune you should listen to, and it's not Justin Bieber, but it also had historical relevance. It was an anti-war song. I explained what was important about it, the impact that it had on, on the culture at the time. The reason I put the starch hat there was I wanted to encourage students to delve in. I want to encourage students to explore. I want to encourage students to go around places that they may not have. And more importantly, because they are so small and tiny, is to actually have to read in a bit more depth. Now, before you start going off nuts and hunting everywhere for badges, open up the officer's mess. Now, this is actually a repeat session, this one here. It's the second time I've done it. So in the repeat session, you'll actually find that people are actually already talking. So what I want you to do, and it's very important that you do this for, for the sake of our demo, if you have found a hat, add a new discussion topic and tell me the hat that you have found. If you can't find a hat, feel free to go in there and say you can't find a hat. But I need you to put in a post, please. 
I'll give you a minute to do that. The idea of the officer's mess, as it says here, have you found a hidden slouch hat? Discovered a fast way to promotion? What about a cool reward? Share what you have found with your fellow comrades in arms as you uncover all the secrets of the course. I am setting up a mystery. A good game has mystery. You look at the games of today, the, the, the Call of Duty, the, the Halo, the Assassin's Creed. Yeah, I, I know not all of you here are gamers, but what all these, the, all the modern games are doing is they're all large narratives and you're driven through this story by wanting to figure out the ending. And so it, it's a very large part of how, how games are played now. Where of course in my day, when I used to pump 20 cent pieces into a game of Galaga, you know, that mystery wasn't as, as important. But nowadays games are traditionally driven by mystery. All right, I'm just going to hit refresh. Hopefully by now you have all put in a post. Next thing I want you to do is I want you to respond to somebody else's. I know I'm rigging it right now, but I'm telling you what to do. But once you put in a post, I want you now to respond to somebody else. You've found a hat, respond to somebody else's post. Once you have done that, go back to the core space. Excuse me. Once you've done that, go back to the core space and tell me what you find. Some people are jumping ahead already. <laughs> what you're seeing here are badges. Now, again, I'm, I'm just going to talk as people catch up. Now, this isn't a random, I wanted to give somebody a badge. This here is actually driven by two very specific wants. The first want is I want to start my perpetual motion of social engagement. Um, it actually has a petrol motion um, engine of social engagement. It just rolls off the tongue. For me, um, I have to find a better, <laughs> better way of shortening it, but that's the only word I found that really describes what I'm wanting to do here. What I'm doing is getting students who would otherwise have just sat there quietly. You know, online learning is renowned for its lurkers, people who will read posts but not participate. If no one participates, then we don't get action. In a classroom, I can target those people. I'll say, no, John, tell me what you think. I can ask them, but it's very difficult to do that in an online space. So what I've done, instead of giving a direction, I'm giving an encouragement. The very first thing we found is that, especially bearing in mind that the courses that you build are targeted at your audience. The audience for this was 17-year-old boys. And so you know, they respond well to challenge, they respond well to competition. It's a stereotype that does ring true uh, quite resoundingly. So as they found hats, they used to go to the officer's mess and start saying, I found a hat. Not necessarily where they found it. They wanted to show off that they had one. To which someone else would often go, well, where did you find it? And they'd put a post up saying, help me please. Or I found this really cool thing. And the very fact that once they did some communication, they unlocked a badge, that in itself started more discussion. The objective behind this first badge was to encourage students to connect, share, and collaborate, which by the way you may have picked up I many of the themes of the iMoot. The iMoot when you say unite, share, collaborate, that for me is many of these key concepts of online education, of online community. So that's the first thing of, of that, that element. It was driven by, in my case, a pedagogical want to get students to engage with each other. Now the reason for the slouch hat was as a historian, I want students to explore. I want students to discover. History is not about saying, I understand it because someone told me this. History is all about going, I understand what I've been told, but I want to validate it by, by finding as many artefacts as possible. So I'm wanting to build historians. I want to build archaeologists. And to do that, I need to give them a sense of wonder. I want to explore, to not just believe what they are told, but to find artefacts to support it. In many ways, history is like science where you might have a, a proposition, but then you actually have, or a hypothesis, 
but then you have to find evidence. And with history, a good historian works with a wide range of evidence and, and, and not good historians focus on a restricted range of evidence. Um, and I shouldn't point out prior ten people. You know, there are people historians who do that on purpose to focus on that one country's point of view. But if you try to get the true picture, you look at multiple elements. So let's go through and talk about. Are you guys ready for me to move on to my the next game in here? I'm seeing everyone's being very quiet in the chat, which tells me that you're having fun exploring the course. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, look, what I'm going to do for a second is uh, just do a piece of screen sharing here because the next one's easier. Actually, no, I don't want to. Let me cancel it, actually. I don't want to screen share because I'm going to give away a badge. Oh, Gareth, I love the way you're working. So I'm going to stop that screen sharing before it loads up too much. Okay. The next thing I want you to do is open up the resource in the Vietnam War topic called Background. Now, if you open up the background, I just, want to, I just need to highlight as well, not every link in this course works. Because of the amount of resources, this is a huge size course. It's full of huge PDF battle maps and, and uh, you know, lots of audio and video. So um, when you go to the background, you actually will see on the side is a, a resources block. I used to love using blocks to put additional resources that would relate, rather than putting everything on the course page. I'll create things such as background and then link to all the battle maps, for instance, in the block here. Those links aren't working in this course because it was just too big to upload everything. So if you're wondering why, that's why. But in the middle of the screen, I have left something there. So here's background, and we're, we're talking about the origins of Vietnam War, where they, they come from. In this case, you know, the colonization of Indochina by France, it created hostilities. In the middle of that screen, you'll notice that there are four pictures. Now, by the way, an average student, even dare I say a pretty good student, will read and absorb this content, especially if I'm directing them. But I want to reward effort for digging in. I want to reward effort for investigation. So if you actually hover over the pictures in the middle of the screen, there are four images there, you'll, excuse me, you'll actually notice they're all links. Now, if you open up each of those four pictures, the first thing you'll notice is rather than just being a picture it does go through and give you information about that image. It's a larger version. It's got a summary of what that picture was. You know, speech of French troops as they're preparing their departure from Vietnam, you know, and, and, you know, marching past the, the graves of the fallen. We've got you know, a picture of the troops leaving after the aftermath of the defeat in um, Viet Minh. You know, these are all the same image, but with a little bit of more information. You know, what it was about. What is this image? If you have opened up all four images and then go back to the course page, you'll find another surprise. Now again, I want to stress, this is all built with Moodle 2.0. Now again, this isn't a game for game's sake. I also didn't tell them what to do. I'm telling you what to do because we don't have time for you guys just to explore for three hours. Um, what I'm again trying to do here is I'm trying to build historians. Yes, they saw an image, but did you want to delve into it? Once they've discovered that they get rewarded for delving into something, they actually want to delve in more. My game is based on creating incentive to self-educate. I'm trying to create self-directed learners. I'm a strong believer of uh, anarchist classrooms. If, you, if you're not familiar with this idea of um, anarchist classrooms, the idea of an anarchist classroom is that, yes, the classroom has a degree of anarchy. I am not in control. I'm a huge believer of student-centered practice. If, I'm, if my students just believe what I tell them, I'm not doing a good job as being a teacher. If I, you know the old line, you know, te teacher. I learned that many told one, you know, teach a man to fish, oh, sorry, to give a man a fish and he, uh, isn't hungry for a day, uh, teach him to fish and uh, he won't be hungry for a lifetime. Uh, I actually prefer Terry Pratchett's Persian. Um, teach a man fire and he's warm for a night, set a man on fire and he's warm forever. Um, I very much believe in this methodology of my education. I want to set my kids on fire, I, which is an awful way of saying it, but I want to get them 
um, excited. I, I want to ignite a passion for education in them. I w if I can turn a student into a lifelong learner, then my job is done. And so I don't believe in dump and pump courseware. These courses are designed, yes, I'm a blended learner. I just want to stress that for those who say pure online, this is a little bit more difficult to do. But the great thing about blended learning is this course here is not replacing my face-to-face -face education. I'm still showing resources in class and doing things. This online course, from a blended learning perspective, is augmenting my classroom, where as I'm telling them in the classroom and they actually go off and explore and learn more on their own and they get all these rewards and they then come back to class and say, hey, last night I got this reward. So yeah, let's also go down. Now, I know some of you actually opened up badges already, but if you haven't, if you scroll down, you'll notice that Mission 2 is not yet available. There is this picture of a, of, a, of a camp. In this case, it's actually one of the US camps uh, in Vietnam at the time. But um, it says Mission Not Yet Available. What I've done here is made that you can't move forward to the next topic until you've completed the first, which, by the way, is what most of us do. But we just do it rather plainly. You can't do this until you finish that. I have dressed it up, and I've dressed it up so it becomes gamish. Now, it, I just want to highlight the stupidity of the statement because it's, it's funny when you think about it. What I'm doing here is saying you can't do topic two until you finish topic one. We do that all the time, and students get frustrated because I want to do topic two. Purely by dressing it, by giving it a bell and whistle, in this case a graphic and, and a narrative, it actually removes lots of the hostility. You know, why do we spend so much time investing in how our classroom looks or on how we look? Well, it's amazing how much things are judged by their appearance. And so by giving this, you can't go to topic two until topic one, dressing it up in the narrative, actually makes it quite interesting. Now, to finish off everything, what you actually have to do is you have to view each of those first three resources. So you have to view resource one, you have to view resource two, you have to view resource three. And then what you have to do is you, there's a forum there which has a, a task. Now, just so you know, again, I, I am going to rig it. You actually have to put two posts or replies. And yes, you're seeing here that uh, because it's just a test site, there are wonderful posts in there, such as posting this just to move forward. Um, everybody has to do two posts. One, it doesn't matter if they're posts or replies, but if you do that in that last forum, you'll actually then complete Mission one. Sally, I'm glad you picked up on it. And, and this is the thing about badges. Um, I am actually very pro-badge and very anti-badge. Because the sad is actually got nothing to do with the badge. It's got nothing to do with the tool. It's, it's the same reason that teachers are pro-Moodle and, and anti-Moodle. We blame the tool for our bad use of the tool. Badges can be used brilliantly. Badges can be used badly. Um, I would not use badges in a classroom the same way I've used them on iMoot. In iMoot, I made a kind of a badge for everything. I just wanted people to play with them and explore with them and muck with them. I wanted them to, to uh, have fun with it. But as I mentioned earlier, the problem with that is that while it does engage some, it actually engages the competitive and the collectors. Um, but it doesn't engage by top students. In fact, they'll be engaged for the first 24 hours but then they lose the engagement because of these things here. And like all rewards, a reward has to have value. If a reward is too easy to be gained, then often it diminishes in its value. Because this is all common sense. So I think many people don't like badges. We're actually blaming the tool rather than thinking about the motivation of how we're using it. So look, that's, that's the example. Now, you guys are not a whole bunch of badges. I want you now to come back to the um, session space, uh, into the big blue button room. Because what I'm going to do now is actually show you how it was built. As this course is about dissecting, I've explained why I've done it, but I also would like to show you how it was done. Give me a second, I'm just about to start screen sharing. There we go, should be coming up in a second. Now, as I said, you may have noticed I've given badges for these as well. The only reason, by the way, I added badges was because, well, what I did in 2.1, I had to use something else. But nowadays, if I was doing this course again, yes, I'd be using badges instead. 
we're looking at now is me looking at the same course in, in, a, in a teacher mode. Everything's not turned on yet. Let me just scroll down to the achievements. You look at where my mouse is. Can anybody tell me what this is in Moodle terms? In regards to Moodle functionality, what is this? Yes, each of these badges is just a label. That's all it is. It's just a label with a picture and some words next to it. And I've been using Moodle's completion settings to do it. Let's go up to the officer's mess for a second. So here is the officer's mess. In fact, it might work if I turn it on at the moment. Give me a second. The officer's mess is a traditional Moodle forum. I'm just going to edit the settings. It's a standard Moodle forum, yeah, standard forum, there's my descriptor up the top. But what I did is I gave it a completion setting. Now, by the way, I did change it for today. You notice the original setting used to be one discussion and one reply. Because for training I wouldn't make it easier to do, I've actually made it one of each, you can, or, or whatever. I mean, you know, it says at the moment it's ticks, but posts or replies. But when I did it live, I actually wanted the students to ask a question and respond to somebody else. Asking questions isn't communicating, that's just me demanding things from you. Responding to somebody isn't also just communication, it's just I'm responding. For me, I wanted to encourage both elements of that practice. So again, it came back out of what I was trying to achieve, what I wanted the student to do, what I wanted their skill to be, and then the badge was rewarded. So here I have at the moment, you know, the student had to do two posts or replies. What made it a game was the mystery that I added. I did not tell the student the rules. <laughs> The student had to figure out the rules for themselves. Now, if I go back to this label, I'm going to edit this label now. The label had this restrict access. In this case, it was only available once the officer's mess was marked complete. It's as simple as that. People go, oh, how do you do it? No, I can't figure it out. It's as simple as that. We do it all the time, but I've made it a game because of the mystery that was added as into how to achieve it. Well, let's go through and look at the next element, the slouch hats. When you clicked on the slouch hat, it linked to something. In fact, I'll, to remind you, I'll bring it up. When you click on the slouch hat, can anybody tell me in Moodle what this is? What is this in Moodle terms? It's a page. That's all it is, just a page, and I've put, again, I'm a big fan of multimodal, so again, there's an image, there is audio, and there's text. You know, I want to be able to engage all these different, you know, um, styles of learning, so uh, I put all of that in there, but it is just a page. But wait a second. Where's that page located? Now, I know some of you have more knowledge than others. Um, that wasn't showing up anywhere in the course. Where is that page? Why can't you see it? It's not hidden. Ah, very good, Bernadette. I was waiting for someone to say that. It is not a hidden topic, no. Be very careful about the use of the word hidden. Ha ha! What I've done here, and I'm going to scroll down now, is I have, so this is what you've seen. There's the topic Vietnam War. There's the topic conscription. But because I'm a teacher, underneath it, is topic four. Now, what you're seeing here, I've actually, I forgot I turned that on. Everybody can actually have seen that earlier. I forgot that it was still there. My apologies, that was because I was showing it off to the last, um, last group. What we have here are what are called orphaned activities. Now, the reason I want to stress, and again, sorry, I didn't mean you to feel bad, Bernadette, but I, I'm always waiting for someone to use the word hidden. Everywhere in Moodle we have VI. You can hide a resource, you can even hide a topic. But hide in Moodle is a very specific term. If something is hidden, it is not visible and not accessible. And it's very important to understand that. If it's hidden, it's not visible and not accessible. So even if I link to that page, the student will get an error that says, sorry, you don't have permission to view this. In fact, when we set up iMoon, sadly a couple of courses, people hid the big blue button room. So some of you may have hit a bug. I think it happened to about three of them. 
where you went to enter a call, uh, enter a big blue button session that said you didn't have permission to view it. It's because we stuffed up and we had to quickly unhide it. Um, it's very important to understand that. So what we do instead in Moodle is I don't show it. Now I'm being pedantic. I'm not hiding it. I'm just not showing it. If I scroll down here, I've got this little button here that allows me to increase the number of sections or decrease the number of sections. This, this feature came in 2.3. It's great, but it used to be you had to go back to your core settings to change this all the time. I can now do it straight from the core screen. If I go through and increase the number of sections, yes, here was topic four. And here are all those pictures that you clicked on. Here is the newspaper clipping that's in the side of one of those side blocks. Here is the, the audio. There's Jimi Hendrix, there's the doors, there's the animals. You know, as, a music, as a music lover, um, you can't go past the music of the Vietnam era. You know, I'm always depressed. You know, I used to joke around because last time I taught Golf War II, I said Golf War I, and, 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 and I must know, I think two was also happening by the time I finished. And I was upset that, you know, what would have happened if we actually had a war? It would have been the music of you know, freedom and, and, and Rick Astley and, you know, I'm so glad we didn't have a war in the 80s. It would have been depressing for a historian to have to read all that music, or listen to all that music again. Um, and there's also all these videos, which are just pages. Here's another cool trick. The photos which you saw, they weren't pages. Even though I showed the photo and a nice description, all I did was add a file resource, or in Moodle 2.3, just clicked and dragged the picture in. And the great thing about it, to make it format it the way that you saw it, many people don't do this, they create pages just to put a picture in a description. You don't need to go through all that work. When you use a file resource, such as an image or a video or an audio, you give it a title, a description, then what we can do is say display resource name and display resource description. By ticking both those boxes, sorry, let me scroll down, and when I go save and display, it already turns it into what looks like a page. With a lot less work, it shows the title, the file, and the description. So it's a lot less work than people who do pages to achieve exactly the same thing. So uh, yeah, I always find that the file resources is, is greatly underused. Just going back to the course, each one of those pictures had completion criteria. So again, you know, here is the defeated French troops. I'm going to edit that. Each of these had completion criteria, but their completion criteria was simple. These were complete. This might finish loading. These are complete once the student viewed the activity. That's all they had to do. But because it was in a topic that wasn't displaying, and again, I'm not saying hidden, because it was in a topic that wasn't displaying, the only way they could reach it was by exploring the content to find the link that took them to it. And they didn't even know it was there until they found the link. So uh, again, there was an essence of mystery. Now here's the kicker. So those two, and for some of you, those things I hope are rather obvious, but here is, here's the kicker. Topic two. I know some of you have now used conditionals a bit. Topic two had this mission not yet available image. And it was there until you finished topic one. How did I do that? And now I know we've got some experienced Moodlers in the room here. How is that done? That picture was there, but then all of a sudden when you were ready, the picture disappeared and all the content showed up. It is completion, but specifically what? Again, I'm looking at the, the I'm putting pressure on the Stuarts, on the Garrets, on the Vinnies here because um, uh, actually, Stephen, I'm, I'm hoping you might get this as well. It's a very underused feature of activity completion. You're allowed to give up. It just means you're not as good as I thought, and I'm disappointed. <laughs> To be careful. Australians do have a strong sense of sarcasm. I, I, I don't mean to offend. I have to be careful when I go um, into multicultural areas. I, I cause lots of grief. 
It's like you know, putting Prince Philip into a, an African nature and just saying, say what you think. It's never a good idea. All right, I'll show you. This here, what is it? Can anybody tell me what this is? Notice that it's inside a topic. What is it? It's a label. But let me show you the settings for it. There is a setting here that hardly anybody uses, and it's one of my favourites. People always talk about something being available if you've done that. You can do B once you've completed A. You can do B once you've passed A. But under Restrict Access, I can also say this label only appears once the discussion task is not complete. People always use must be marked complete. They think about that, this happens if you've done that. But no, we can also do the opposite question. Now, the discussion task was the very last thing you had to do in topic one. And I will explain, this is actually easier now, but you know, at the moment this was, had to be done. This, uh, once you finish that last element of topic one, you could do this. So what I said is this label only appears if you haven't completed that. And so by reversing the question, the image was here until you had achieved that uh, discussion forum task. In fact, must not be marked complete has fantastic uses that I'm always amazed that people don't use it for. Um, I'm a big fan of differentiation of task. Now what I mean by differentiation of task, I'm a big fan, I, I used to work with, um, with girls first, and again, girls are far better at uh, undirected learning. What I mean by that is with boys you, you find your tasks have to be a little bit more specific. These are stereotypes, I'm not trying to be sexist, it's just traditionally how we see these things occurring. And so with boys we usually put a lot more structure around a task. Girls actually thrive a lot more when we put a lot more freedom around it. When, we, when I say, well, then here are, there are four different ways you can do this task, which one do you prefer? Which is great for supporting different learning styles. But it comes with a catch. In the online space, I used to, well, actually I used to, I, I don't teach that anymore. Nowadays I'm you know, consulting full time. But when I used to teach uh, face to face, I would often say, okay, you've got a choice of three deliveries. You can either um, write an essay, uh, you can actually build a project if you actually want to you know, physically build something to illustrate that, or record a video. And then I'll assess it based on the same outcomes. And again, this is why I love Justin's comment. You know, just because we teach to stand, it doesn't mean we have to teach to stand away. I've been doing that in the classroom as well. And so the students will then re reply to me with their assessment as one of these three different things. Well, in a classroom, it's relatively easy, well, easier to keep that on track. Online, if I was to create three separate tasks and tell students to do one of the following, can anybody tell me what happens eight times out of ten? I've told them to please do one of the following three tasks. What happens eight times out of ten? Bingo, because students love reading instructions. <laughs> and it's true, I pick on them. Um, as teachers, we're not necessarily better ourselves. No, they don't read the instruction. And then they demand, especially adults, are then into a realm of going, well, I've done this extra work, I demand extra credit. Rather, and, it's, and because of that, especially when I go to tertiary or TAFE institutions, so technical colleges, vocational education, they refuse to do those kinds of things in Moodle because all that's going to happen is they won't read the instructions. So, being in the HSC, Lynn, I've been a HSC marker, I know. Uh, although it was quite a long time ago, it used to drive me insane. But anyway, let's not get caught up on that. Um, so in Moodle, actually, they, they don't do it because uh, because I'm not there to direct them. You know, I'm not there to direct them directly. There's a good coin of phrase. Because I'm not there to actually tell them exactly what to do. I have to work to lowest common denominator. That is not true. What I will do is I'll sometimes put up three tasks, but each of them has a condition. This only shows up if that one is not complete. This one shows up if those two are not complete. The great thing is, is that once they've completed one, the others disappear. I don't even have to worry about them not reading instructions because they can't stuff it up even if they wanted to stuff it up. So yeah, it must not be marked complete. Often people think of what would I use that for? It has fantastic use. It is indeed a flip-flop. And if I go back to the course, 
these things, these additional resources actually popped up once the, once the discussion forum was complete. So the opposite requirement. This happened if they weren't complete, this happened if it was complete. And that's why you've got, you've got this toggle, the flag. You get one or the other. So look, that's it. I know I'm running out of time here, but hopefully I've now given you some ideas. Now, as I said, I apologise it's not up there yet. Apparently running an iMoke takes time. You know, um, you know, Vinny and all the others who have been doing this as well, we, uh, we, we think we have all the time up our sleeves because we have got so many of us doing it, but um, sadly up behind the eight ball. I will be uploading the backup file for this course. Now the backup file I believe is a 2.2 backup file meaning that as long as you have a Moodle that's later than 2.2, you can actually restore this course into your own site and play with it, reverse engineer it, dissect it, take it apart, see what you like, see what you didn't, find out how the, the orphaned activities, the activities that weren't shown. Um, I'll hopefully have that up online in the next hour. But uh, yeah, hopefully you've got some ideas now on, on how you do gamification. As I said, my, my closing point really is this. Gamification is not about the bells and whistles. Um, gamification, uh, so it, it can include it, but it's not the key. Gamification is about creating a narrative and problem and using rewards to drive students through that. And if you can do that, you'll engage them. And if you can engage them, well, that's common sense. Then we've got a greater chance of getting our information passed through. So questions? Stuart, just so you know, it's actually the first time I've done this. I've actually used this Vietnam War course a couple of times. It's actually the first time I've done dissection of it. So, uh, no, thank you for coming. I'll stop the screen sharing now just so we don't lose all that bandwidth. Um, any questions, please feel free to grab the microphone if you wish or, or, or type into the chat. Well, thank you, Libby. I'm, I'm glad it was useful. I saw a question. What theme is this? Um, this is actually a theme I threw together. It's actually quite a bit buggy at the moment. Uh, I'm amazed we haven't had more complaints. We, some of us will say, that, some people say that we are very brave. Others will say we're very stupid. But um, when Moodle, Moodle 2.5 has only been out for a couple of weeks, and we upgraded to 2.5 quite literally on day one. And we discovered that the theme that we had had issues that wasn't compatible with Moodle 2.5. And so I gave myself a day to quickly throw a new theme together. So this is just a theme I threw together um, to put on because we had 2.5. And, and to be honest, it's also uh, using a, a new thing in Moodle 2.5. If you attended Martin's keynote, you would have heard about it called Bootstrap. So this is also my very first attempt using Bootstrap. And so it's worked well. Um, the theme is going to be released. It's not in good enough shape to be released yet, trust me. But if you go to the Moodle forums, um, there's a, a discussion in the Moodle forums on what's now called the essential theme. So I kind of want to make this a really cool one. Um, and people are already helping bug fix it. And uh, by the time, yeah, it'll probably be a couple of months before I'd say it's release ready. But you, I am sharing it. I, I share everything that I create. So um, you'll be able to, to grab this. Look for the essential theme in the forums. But right now, as I put in that forum post, you can probably find it. It's buggy. It's <laughs> it's not it's not for production yet. I'm amazed it's worked as well here. Oh, thank you, Gareth. Stuart, thank you for coming. Yeah, I hope to catch up soon. If you are a coder, or if you have access to coders who could help, you know, clean it up a bit, um, the more people we have helping clean it up, um, the sooner I'll be able to release it out. But uh, it has worked surprisingly well, I have to say, far better than I expected. But any questions about the game-based learning? Um, uh, are we all happy? Enthused? Inspired? Boy? Yes, Gareth, I have discovered there is a couple of booster issues, but... Ah, oh, Lynn, thank you. Uh, I don't know if I'd agree with that. I've seen some fantastic sessions uh, around. Make sure you catch the replays or other ones. No, Lynn, you know, but Lynn, thank you. No, I'm glad you enjoyed it.
Yeah, and, and Sarge, I, I, I agree. Badges can be used for both formative and summative assessment. I, I don't think we should think of them as gimmicks. Um, they can be a gimmick, and they can be a fantastic gimmick. But uh, have you come to the session on open badges that I did yesterday? Um, it is now being repeated. We've actually added. We, we sadly had someone pull out last minute due to illness. Um, so if you didn't catch the open badges session, we actually talk about you know open badges and they use for formative assessment a bit. Um, come along to that if you can. So it, it's now on the program. I don't, I, I don't know time zones. You check out the program, just look for the next session on open badges and hopefully you can make it. <laughs> yes, Gareth, I'll see you on the flip flop side. Um, thank you for coming, mate. It was good to see you again. All right, look, I, I don't think we have any more questions. Um, enjoy the rest of iMoot. Thank you very much for coming. This, this MOOC wouldn't be anything without you and, and your participation and your feedback. So uh, thank you for being such an active, active member and uh, I will see you around the iMoot. Thank you very much. <laughs>